Hello everyone, welcome. Thanks for tuning in. In this video, I will be talking about how to perform basic phonological analysis. This is a task that introductory linguistic students will see and probably be terrified at, and it's something that uh, linguists will have to do throughout their careers, but it's excellent practice because it helps to distinguish between the difference between phonemes and allophones very generally, and also gives you practice with individual languages when you're determining the relationship among sounds within that language. So, uh, this is something that I've been wanting to do for some time is to make a video on this because I know that a lot of students will encounter this in their introductory linguistics class, so I thought I'd walk you through the process in doing that and give you some advice. Um, first, I just want to mention before I go any further, it's really important that you watch uh, my video on phonemes and allophones as well as my three-part series on phonetics. That's necessary to give you a base of knowledge in order to understand the content of this video. If you don't watch that content first, then none of this stuff is going to make any sense to you. So first, by way of an overview here, just to mention, we will be looking at four phonological analysis problems from four different languages. So uh, when you're looking at a data set here, the first thing I want to say is to just try to ignore anything that you may know or not know about that language. If you don't know anything about Sindhi, that's okay. It's a language that's spoken in Pakistan and India, um, but just sort of look at this data set as if, it's were, it, as if it were its own uh, self-contained universe. So conversely, if you happen to know something about Cindy, just try to put all that aside and simplify your task because you're only focusing on this data here, not on data that is not represented in this data set. So uh, what I have here at the top I think will be of use to you because it is essentially a two-step process for solving a phonological analysis problem. So let's walk through this very briefly. Now, if you're looking at a data set like this and you're putting aside everything that you know or don't know, the first step when looking at the data set before you is to identify minimal pairs. Now you might ask, what is a minimal pair? Well, let's stop and talk about this. As I have here, uh, there are three minimal pairs that we could use to illustrate this concept. A minimal pair is really important to understand and it's necessary to perform phonological analysis. A minimal pair are two forms in a language that are the exact same except for one sound. So let's talk about each of these examples. A minimal pair in English could be the word heat and the word meat. First thing you want to do is ignore how it is spelled in English and actually transcribe it into the International Phonetic Alphabet, which is represented here in between the uh, brackets. So heat uh, and meat, they have the same vowel, E, they have the same final consonant, T, but where they differ is in that initial, initial consonant. Heat uses the glottal fricative, and meat uses the bilabial nasal, M. So, they are two forms in a language that are the exact same except for one sound, which is at the beginning. Similarly, we can look at the difference between heat and hut. Uh, they have the same initial consonant, they have the same final consonant, t, but this time where they differ is in their vowels. So, heat has this high vowel, e, uh, excuse me, e, and hut has this more central vowel, uh, the wedge. So, uh, the last example is heat and heel whether to uh, make better or the part of the body. Uh, but either way, it's another minimal pair here because they have the same initial consonant, the same vowel, but this time the difference is with that final consonant. So these are three uh, examples that illustrate a minimal pair. Again, two forms in a language that are the exact same except for one sound. So that's really important for our task here because you need to do that first. When you're looking over a data set, you want to identify if they are minimal pairs or not. So if there are minimal pairs with the sounds in question, then you know right off the bat that those sounds are different phonemes. So going back to this example between heat and meat, this one example tells us that in this context here, and m are two different phonemes because it's a, contra a contrastive distribution. If you change the consonant at the beginning of this word, or in this context, um, you know, you might be talking about warmth, as in heat, and if you change it to a m, then it changes uh, the meaning of the word to, like, convene, or to meet. So that's what phonemes do. They are in contrastive distribution, but allophones are in complementary distribution. So, uh, again, look through the data set and can you find minimal pairs with the sounds in question? If you do, then all you do is say, okay, they're different phonemes and I know this, and you list the minimal pairs. That's it. 
Now, if you cannot find any minimal pairs with the sounds in question in the data set that you're looking at, then you know that they must be allophones of the same phoneme. And if that's the case, you have to move to step two. And this is where you have to determine the phonological environment in which each sound occurs. That sounds scary, but all you're determining is where you find each sound. So for example, one sound or one allophone might appear at the beginning of a word. It might appear between vowels or at the end of words. And another allophone might appear just after nasal sounds or after or before velar consonants. So a uh, phonological environment is really just a fancy way of saying where do you get one sound and where do you get the other. Okay, let's walk through this first data set here. And again, this is from the language Cindy. So we're actually looking for a minimal triplet because there are three sounds in question here. And we have an aspirated, uh, excuse me, an unaspirated P, aspirated P, and a B, or B. So again, look over this data set and feel free to pause the video, but can you identify a minimal triplet with these three sounds? So you're looking for three forms that are the exact same except for one uses P, one uses aspirated P, and the other uses B. Pause your video, can you find a minimal triplet with those sounds? So, uh, after looking it over, you will see that the answer is yes, there is a minimal triplet with these three sounds, and that is in uh, letter A, which is anu, in uh, letter F, which is panu, and then in letter J, which is banu. So these three forms, A, F, and J, are a minimal triplet. You have three forms that are the exact same except for that initial consonant sound where they differ using each of these sounds. So if you see this sort of example, then all you have to do at this point is write these three sounds are different phonemes because the minimal triplet is A, F, and J. Now, incidentally, you might notice that there are a couple of other uh, minimal pairs. Like, for example, there is a minimal pair here with letter B and letter I, the difference between voju and voju. But we can disregard that because it concerns a minimal pair with the sounds b and v. And notice in the instructions for this problem, it's not asking about those sounds. So we just put it aside, forget about it, ignore it. We're only looking about the sounds in question here. And we've determined that the minimal triplet is A, F, and J. So you just write that down. They're phonemes, and here's the minimal triplet. Now, let's move to our second problem, and this is a totally different language, and we're looking at two different sounds. And this is standard Italian. So forget about what you might know or not know about this language. Just look at this data set as if it were its own self-contained universe. So we just stick to our toolkit here, and our first step tells us what? we need to look for minimal pairs. So, feel free to pause the video and can you identify any minimal pairs with these two sounds? So after looking over this data set, you will see that no, there are no minimal pairs with these two sounds. So that means right off the bat, we can tell that these two sounds must be allophones of the same phoneme in this language. Now we need to move to step two, and step two in our instructions tells us we need to figure out the phonological environment, or where you get one sound, mm, and where you get the other, mm. So the easiest thing that I would suggest you do when you are faced with this task is to write down the environments for each one of these sounds. So what I've written here are the environments for each one of these sounds. And that's what I suggest you do, whether on a, uh, a computer or if you have a hard copy and you're writing this down. It's just a lot easier to visually organize the information and to be able to identify the patterns where each one of these sounds occur. So we have two sounds that we're looking at again. We have n, which uh, I've written down over here, and we have m. So let me just briefly talk about the shorthand that I'm using here to help me identify where each of these sounds occurs. So, like in letter A, we have this, uh, the word tinta for die. And so, there is an n present in that, uh, in that word. And that's where I'm leaving the blank here, to represent the n. But I'm really more concerned with the sounds immediately next to it. So, before it, we have the vowel e, representing with the lowercase i in the IPA. And then we have right next to it a t, written with a t in the IPA. So, you just do that with each form in which that sound, n, appears. And then in letter B in this data set, again, we see that N appears uh, after E, but then before D, and so forth. 
Now you might be wondering, what is this pound symbol or hashtag? And that means a word boundary. So like in letter D in this data set, N appears at the very beginning of the word, and I just use the hashtag pound symbol. It's a common convention in linguistics to represent a word boundary. And in this position, it means uh, in a word initial position. And then right after it, of course, we get that E vowel. So after you write down uh, for uh, basically, yeah, letters A through F, those are the only forms in which the sound N appears. You have the environment laid out over here. Now on the other side of this page, I have done the same thing, but with the counterpart N. So this is our velar nasal, and we want to see where does this sound occur? Well, it's actually kind of already organized for us because N appears in A through F in this data set and N mm appears in letters G through L in this data set. But you're doing the same thing. Notice that N mm appears in between the vowel E and G, so I've written it over here. It occurs again in letter H after E and before, uh, oops, made a mistake there, I should say, I should say G. Uh, but again, U and G for the word for mushroom, uh, and so forth. So, you know, try to try not to make errors like I just did there, but, you know, it's good to double check your work, of course. So, once you have the pattern sort of listed for both of these sounds, now you have to compare where do you find one and where do you find the other. So we could start with N, and we could see N mm, is appearing, well, before a T, before a D, before an E after vowels it looks like, so yeah, kind of tough to determine a pattern there, or maybe at the beginning of a word, but maybe it's a lot easier if we look at this sound instead. So the velar nasal, mm, well, it's always occurring after vowels. This can occur after vowels too, so that's not the distinguishing criteria, but notice here that mm is always occurring before a g or a k, and n never does that. So we have determined where you find this sound, mm. And then we're in a position where we could actually write this down as a kind of formalized rule, which is something that you might be asked to do. Now what I've written up here is the rule that you would indicate uh, to kind of summarize the differences in environments where each of these sounds occur. So we've already identified that m mm occurs in this very specific environment preceding g or k. Now, if you look at the International Phonetic Alphabet, you will notice that g and k have something in common, and that is that they are both velar stops. So, you could actually indicate that in a rule. You could say that the phoneme m is realized, or phonetically realized, as the sound m, and the slash means here, in the environment before a velar sound. Or you could say velar stop. Or yet another uh, way that you could write this is to write that the phoneme n is realized as the sound ng in the environment before k and g. And I'm just kind of using these other brackets to indicate it's both of those sounds. So once you've determined that very specific environment in which ng appears, it is sufficient to indicate that the other allophone, n, appears everywhere else. So this is a very short way of doing that, is that the phoneme n is realized as the allophone n elsewhere. So you can only write this elsewhere once you have indicated a very specific environment for the other allophone that accompanies it. So this is essentially what you would be writing down for a question like the standard Italian uh, data set that you see here. Now I'm going to ask you to try to do this on your own. So look at standard Spanish first and then Biblical Hebrew and see if you can determine whether the sounds in question for standard Spanish are different phonemes or whether they are allophones of the same phoneme and then do the same thing for Biblical Hebrew. I'll give you a few minutes, uh, but what I mean by that is you should stop, pause this video and try to work on this on your own and then unpause the video. Okay, so hopefully you've taken a few minutes and uh, if you're successful then you should see something like what I have written down here. Again, first I've written down the environments for each one of these allophones, d over here and th, the interdental fricative over here. And, uh, you know, you'll look at these and you'll say, all right, well, I don't know, it doesn't seem like it follows any discernible pattern for this sound, d. But over here you'll notice that it occurs in a very specific environment, that th always, only include, uh, is only happening in between vowels. That never happens with the sound d. So then we can write a rule, which I have indicated down here, that you get the phoneme D 
phonetically realized as the allophone th in the environment between vowels. So once you've written that, it is totally sufficient to then say that you get the allophone d phonetically realized as the allophone d everywhere else. So that is what you would write for this problem here. These two sounds are allophones, and here's the rule that tells you where you get one allophone and where you get the other. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about the biblical Hebrew problem down here. So take a few minutes, uh, pause this video, and determine the relationship between these two sounds here. Are they phonemes, uh, or are they allophones of the same phoneme? Pause this video and see if you can figure with it figure out which one it is. Okay, so hopefully you've taken a few minutes and uh, made some headway. Maybe you've even solved this problem. Now, at first glance, this is uh, really difficult, and it is indeed probably the most difficult out of these four problems, but uh, don't panic. If you stick to your toolkit here and you have a careful eye, then you can notice the pattern soon enough. So, uh, the first thing is, well, there's no minimal pairs here with the sounds in question. Yeah, we've got a minimal pair with B and C in this data set, but that's between the sounds O and E, and we're not concerned with those. We are only concerned with the sounds P and F. So if you look through this data set, unfortunately, you won't see a minimal pair with those two sounds. That means that these sounds must be allophones of the same phoneme. So we need to figure out where we get one sound and where we get the other. And I've written the environments in which P appears over on this margin. And on this margin, I've uh, written down all the environments in which the sound F appears. So if you look through these, then hopefully soon enough, the pattern will become clear and will jump out to you. And the pattern is this, that with the allophone P, it always appears uh, before a vowel, no matter what. It's always appearing before a vowel. Now, with the sound F, its counterpart, the other, this allophone, is always happening after a vowel. Sometimes it occurs before a vowel, but what it always does is it always comes after a vowel. So, it maybe takes a little bit more time to identify, but that's the rule that you would essentially write down here, that the alloph excuse me, that the phoneme P is phonetically realized as the allophone P, or unaspirated P, I guess, uh, in the environment before a vowel, whereas uh, the other allophone appears after a vowel. So, uh, this is something that you can use in every phonological analysis problem that you encounter. It's just a two-step process here. You identify the minimal pairs first. If you find minimal pairs with the sounds in question, you know that those sounds belong to different phonemes. And if they're different phonemes, then you just have to show the minimal pairs that prove it. But if there's no minimal pairs with the sounds in question in that data set, then they must be allophones of the same phoneme. And then you have to go to step two, which is the hardest part of this process, to determine the phonological environment in which each sound occurs. So we did that, and hopefully you found in the case of uh, kind of walking through this and getting a little practice yourself that this is a bit easier. It will, of course, get easier and easier the more practice you get with these, and uh, that's something that uh, you should look for on the internet, is there's a lot of phonological analysis problems to be found. Now, in the meantime, I want to say thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it was helpful, and I'll talk to you all soon. Thanks so much.